One particular entertainment company, above all, has defined villainy in the modern age. The House of Mouse is such a deeply embedded part of our childhoods that in many ways Disney villains have become canonical to Western culture. Many of its heroes are iconic, but three of its villains in particular illuminate our understanding of a dark kind of culture. Cloud Frollo, Scar, and Darth Vader. These are among the most recognizable villains in all of fiction, not to mention some of the scariest. And throughout the years, Disney's portrayal of villains has resonated in our hearts and minds, informing our very notion of what it means to be good or evil. Disney has certainly had periods where its heroes and villains were relatively uh, simple and straightforward. You know, think Robin Hood uh, and, you know, Prince John, you know, Bambi and the Fox and the Hound. Like these are all areas where you're, you have a pretty clear cut uh, view of what heroes and villains are. But as things change in the broader culture and in society, we start to question what heroes really are and whether or not villains might be justified. Indeed, as the culture changed and as the 20th century wore on, with consistent storytelling genius and innovation, Disney's villains began to reflect the ever-evolving society and political landscape of which it was a crucial part. There are certainly all types of different villains who work for different reasons. Classic villains are often pretty one-dimensional in their character development. They are twisted, hateful, you know, mustache twirling, scheming, dishonest, and unlikable. Uh, they are pretty simple in their motivations. Scar from The Lion King is one such villain. His motives are not complicated. He lusts for power. He has no care for who gets hurt in the process. Cloud Frollo is also that person. Uh, he wants what he wants, and because he's not going to take it and change the way that he views morality, he's going to kill that thing, burn it at the stake, dominate it, control it. Um, it's pretty dark stuff. Those villains have incredible worth for storytelling because there are such people such clearly just evil, twisted individuals out there in the world. Most people rise above it, and some are consumed by it. This is a pretty basic takeaway from real-world psychiatrist Carl Jung, who popularized in the 20th century the idea of the shadow self in the West. But there are villains that we see ourselves in, you know, the people who lost that fight against the darkness inside of them. And you get that kind of journey and that fall to hell with Shakespearean characters like Macbeth, all the way up to modern figures such as Darth Vader. Vader, whose unique brand of evil was unleashed on the world in 1977, has appeared in Disney parks since 1987, and was officially acquired by Disney in 2012, Cloud Frollo from The Hunchback of Notre Dame, based on Victor Hugo's 1831 French Gothic novel, and Scar from The Lion King, the 1994 film based in part on stories from the Bible and Shakespeare, offer a window into the psyches of the totalitarian dictators who have dominated the globe, especially during the 20th century, but even going back to ancient Rome dictators who brought about massive suffering and death in the vain belief that they could bring about a perfect world. In their similarities and differences, these three characters, Vader, Frollo, and Scar, illuminate our understanding of the world we inhabit and the real-life political tendencies and mindsets of totalitarians. Uh, grandiose, cynical, sadistic, controlling, distrustful of art, and very compelled by imagery and illusion. Um, basically, the mindset, the traits of totalitarians is whatever is not part of the liberal mindset, which hinges on openness to new experiences and curiosity, humility, and discovery. 
if those things are liberal, then the authoritarian instinct is everything that is the opposite of those things. This video will dive deep into Cloud Frollo, Scar, and Darth Vader's actions, motivations, and personalities. In doing so, we'll come to understand how and why they're portrayed the way they are, and we might even shed light on the dark side in all of us. We'll start there with the dark side and with Darth Vader. Spoilers will follow. This is The Invisible Lens. The story of why Darth Vader becomes evil starts long before we see him in that iconic all-black armor. We learn that Anakin Skywalker, hero of the galaxy, turned into the terrifying machine-like Vader after his hopes were vanquished and his fear of losing everything overcame him. He feared losing Padme and felt powerless to save her. He was manipulated by Chancellor Palpatine. He was betrayed by the Jedi Order and became disillusioned. And it was only then that he embraced the dark side, taking on the name Darth Vader and fully losing touch with his humanity, as represented by that black suit of armor. Anakin's transformation into Darth Vader is a tragic fall from grace, driven by a combination of personal vulnerabilities, manipulation, and the allure of power. But that's why Darth Vader works as a great villain. We can see ourselves in him. He becomes an oppressor as a way to exercise his inner demons. If you punch this question, who is the greatest villain of all time, into Google search, number one is always Darth Vader, uh, correctly. Because you have an arc in this character where he is fearsome, scary, unnerving, and inhuman at the start of the story. Kids have been afraid of Darth Vader for four decades now. I remember a child at my daughter's sixth birthday party just a handful of years ago crying when we watched Star Wars because Darth Vader is scary. And as Obi-Wan Kenobi says, He's more machine now than man, twisted and evil. But this, of course, changes when we learn in Star Wars and in Empire Strikes Back that Vader is human. No, I am your father. No! And used to be this hero of the galaxy known as Anakin Skywalker. Immediately, audiences then have to ask themselves, well, how could this be? And if they are thoughtful, they would take away from this that they also could be forces for darkness if they are not careful. Luke encounters this reality when he's training to be a Jedi on Dagobah and the Empire Strikes Back, when he ventures into a cave on the swamp planet, and he asks Master Yoda, What's in there? And Yoda says, Only what you take with you. What he encounters in there is Darth Vader, a shadow apparition, a vision of Darth Vader. And he fights Darth Vader like he's fighting a demon in this cave. And of course, when he defeats Darth Vader in this vision, the mask is cracked open and he sees only himself. So you go back to Yoda. What you see in there is only what you take with you. <laughs> and what he took with him was inherent darkness. What he took with him was a capacity to also be evil and to be Darth Vader. This is an essential moral lesson, but also a political one. We must understand from stories like Star Wars that are utopian visions of a better world, one where people die who shouldn't, one that is fair and always just, that people have dreamed of this for thousands of years. Your ideas for a society and a system of laws that fix every problem are not new. I don't think the system works. How would you have it work? We need a system where the politicians sit down and discuss the problem, agree what's in the best interest of all the people, and then do it. That's exactly what we do. The, the trouble is that people don't always agree. Well, then they should be made to. By whom? Who's going to make them? I don't know. Someone. You? Of course not me. But someone. Someone wise. In this scene on Naboo, 
in Star Wars Episode II, Attack of the Clones. E audiences should see a very familiar character in Anakin Skywalker that they have had discussions about politics and government with before. How many times have you spoken to a friend and they articulated that, you know, politics is is bad, it doesn't work, you know, politicians are, are scummy and don't have the interests of the people at heart. Uh, but a better system, of course, would be one where everybody can agree on what is in the, the common interest of the people and then do it. This is exactly how Anakin Skywalker thinks. He's a very common person in that way. He thinks that politics should be about action. Many idealistic young people view politics as being about change and action. And when you ask them who's going to actually make those decisions, they assume someone else will do it. A wise man, a philosopher king. But often the philosopher king doesn't exist. The wise man does not actually pursue politics. Politics is usually left to less than wise people, purely ambitious people, people who want power, people who want to do things. And Anakin Skywalker is a man of action. He is a person who solves problems with a lightsaber. He has great power himself in the force. And so he wants to see politics work. He wants to see agreement about the common good and then politicians who are willing to do those things. But as Padme points out to, to Anakin in this scene, that's not what democratic government is about. It is about deliberation, conversation, process, rule of law, um, and compromise. But that often comes at the expense of getting things done. So Anakin suggests very simply that, well, no, we should have somebody wise and powerful and interested in the good of the public who sits atop government and helps people come to a decision on what to do. And Padme gives the correct response, which is... Sounds an awful lot like a dictatorship to me. But Anakin's response is... Well, if it works. There are a lot of people like that out in the world in different democratic societies who view politics and democracy as something that is a luxury, something that we should do when things are good. But when things are bad, it's a obstruction. It's a barrier that needs to be overcome. And so, if it works, totalitarianism is a means to an end. The question is, what is the end? What is the good that is being pursued? Uh, and Padme understands that no one really knows what that is, which is what democracy is for. George Lucas's portrayal of, well, everything in the Star Wars universe, but especially the development of Anakin Skywalker and Darth Vader's character, was deliberate and precise. Even though we're in a galaxy far, far away, Lucas leaves little to interpretation and nothing to chance by basing the settings and characters in historical reality. Well, the Republic of Star Wars follows a pretty classic historical model of decadence, expansionism, gridlock, and then decline, as modeled primarily by the Roman Republic in real-world history. Uh, this government of Star Wars finds itself in the prequel trilogy, episodes 1, 2, and 3, in a civil war and desperate for someone to bring order out of all of that chaos. And the Republic Senate of Star Wars gives away emergency powers to its democratically elected leader, Chancellor Palpatine, only to realize that he never really intended to relinquish that power at all. The revolution, though, is only made possible. You know, the societal revolution from Republic to Empire is only made possible by a fallen angel figure of sorts, being Anakin Skywalker, who has a hatred for change and the unpredictable things in life. And that drives him towards totalitarianism and helping Palpatine dismantle the Republic. Anakin Skywalker is a pretty pretty strong Julius Caesar figure. He is a warrior. He's charismatic. He is adored by the public, and he loathes career politicians. He has a strong will toward the common good and sees politics and democracy as a hurdle to doing things that must be done to make the republic better off. 
Caesar was not wrong in how he identified Rome's Senate as a corrupted, self-serving, and elitist cabal. Caesar was not wrong when he viewed politicians like Cato and Cicero to be overly idealistic, uh, you know, fat and happy, and uninterested with the everyday concerns of everyday Romans. Anakin Skywalker, of course, does not become emperor. Palpatine does. But Anakin, like Caesar, is the blunt force object that opens the door to empire being possible. Julius Caesar never actually becomes emperor. He just proved that the common people of Rome wanted a strong man and an emperor instead of the republican system of government. And in the same way, Anakin Skywalker opens the door for Emperor Palpatine to establish authoritarianism and empire across the galaxy, but he ultimately just pays the price by living out the rest of his life in the suit of armor, suffering without his arms, without his legs, with a breathing apparatus. Um, you know, he, he pays an ultimate price in many ways, the same way that Julius Caesar pays an ultimate price for empire, uh, dying at the hands of the Senate. While Darth Vader is arguably the greatest villain of all time, Scar, less than 30 years after his 1994 debut, is well on his way to a similarly iconic status. While in part his character is based on towering literary figures, namely King Claudius from Shakespeare's Hamlet, he resonates so profoundly with audiences because his character is based in a historical reality that we're all familiar with. Scar from Lion King is a pretty classic Stalinist figure. He is a kleptocrat, a thug, a murderer, who is able to use the disjointed language of equality for all, and then stand atop the rubble of society and just blame outside forces for why his egalitarian dream fails. Ooh, it just me. I'm surrounded by idiots. Communists never have to reckon with the fatal flaws of their worldview because they always have capitalism existing as an outside boogeyman, an outside force that is sabotaging their success. With Scar and the starvation that he brings upon the Pride Lands and the Lion King, I'm absolutely reminded of stuff like empty grocery store shelves in Venezuela. You can have an ideology that supports free food and everybody should be able to get, you know, whatever they quote unquote need and that no one ever goes hungry. But without costs, people will take more than what they need. They will simply take what they want, which is usually too much. You get this with supply hoarding and runs on the grocery store. The ugly truth is that pricing and sometimes even price gouging controls that human nature impulse to take more than what is needed. Uh, Scar sets the hyenas free across the Pride Lands to take whatever they want, and the food supply is wiped out, and people at uh, lions start starving to death. And he takes zero responsibility for that. Scar, there's no food, no water. Yeah, it's dinner time, and we ain't got no sticking entrees. It's the lioness's job to do the hunting. He views it as a, as a fluke, a thing that just happened. And, you know, when the lionesses actually want to migrate and move locations, he would rather them stay in place and all starve to death than relocate in search of, of new food supplies. And so he, you know, he just shifts the blame and is willing to let people die to uphold his illusion about being a good leader. Pride Rock in the start of Lion King is a thriving and delicate ecosystem. And the story begins with Mufasa. You have a Lion King who is in touch with the circle of life and balance that must be struck between predator and prey. Uh, and basically, you know, your, your needs and your wants. And it ends with Scar destroying this balance and unleashing the predators or the hyenas to eat whatever and whenever they want. And in that total indulgence, the lions end up with nothing to eat. And the pride lands of Lion King are 
left bone dry by the time Simba comes home to save the kingdom. It's, it's not beautiful. There's no grass on the ground. There are skulls and bones everywhere uh, because basically we've eliminated in Scar's society all boundaries for how the circle of life should work and restraint and self-control, uh, only indulgence. And when you get that, uh, you end up with uh, deprivation. Paris of the Hunchback of Notre Dame is also a, a relatively dark society in a somewhat exciting time in history. It's living under the thumb of the Catholic Church during the Renaissance. It's a time of beauty and incredible change all across Europe, artistic expression. But with change, you also get the forces that resist change. Cloud Frollo is the villain of this story and the archdeacon of the church. And he is waging a war on that change. He's waging a war on migrants, artists, cultural evolution in Paris. But basically, Cloud Frollo represents this, this force that is offering people an alternative to change. Uh, but that often requires an authoritarian mindset and authoritarian methods. <laughs> The tomato throwing incident as an act of public humiliation is a reassertion of Cloud Frollo over who gets to decide what is viewed as good, normal, and abnormal in society. Uh, this is a moment where Quasimodo is being accepted and appreciated by people, but it is important to Cloud Frollo's power and control, not over just Paris, but over the Hunchback of Notre Dame that he be viewed as small, insignificant, and unworthy. Creating a fear of speaking, of being different, of doing things like saying the emperor has no clothes, this is all timeless stuff. Cloud Frollo, as the religious man in town, the archdeacon of the church, he has an illusion to maintain, which is that he is pure, and that the people he views as pure are heroes in the town and he can't have the Hunchback of Notre Dame be viewed heroically or as good. This scene is all about reasserting that and putting him down. Although ostensibly made and marketed for kids, Disney's portrayal of these dictators can't help venturing into the depraved. The similarities in the following two scenes suggest it would be nigh impossible to create realistic representations of these politically manipulative totalitarians without also demonstrating that their evil tendencies and desire for absolute control pervade through to their private lives. You think you've outwitted me, but I'm a patient man. And gypsies don't do well inside stone walls. Here we see Cloud Frollo encroaching upon Asmeralda, seizing her physically, twisting her arms, smiling while he's doing it, smelling her hair and encroaching upon her physically. He's pressing his body up against her and holding her neck. Uh, this is not about purity. This is about power. And for Cloud Frollo, a religious zealot, uh, this Catholic archdeacon, he has this relationship to sin, to lust, to sex, that it is forbidden. And Asmerelda, as a symbol of all of those things in many ways, um, is a thing that has to be destroyed. Uh, but for him, destruction and domination are one and the same. Uh, there's a lot that could be said by a psychiatrist about how those things happen. Um, but when you have an unhealthy relationship to sex, lust, and desire, um, really scary things can happen. I'm haunted by the kiss that you should never have given me. My heart is beating hoping that that kiss will not become a scar. You are in my very soul, tormenting me. 
This scene is, is pretty disturbing. Throughout Anakin Skywalker's character arc, we often see that he has wants, he has desires, you know, he's a young man, he's, he's a Jedi, but he has responsibilities. And when he wants something, in this case, he wants Padme, he wants to be romantically involved with her, um, he is ashamed of those feelings. And he puts in this scene his desire for Padme on her. <laughs> he blames her, in essence, for his attraction to her. He says, you're tormenting me um, and invading his thoughts because he's not supposed to be like this. He is a Jedi, meaning he's abstaining from relationship, from love, from sex. Like a priest in many ways, he's like Frollo. He's supposed to not feel these things because he is a holy man. Of course, in the ways that Cloud Frollo in The Hunchback of Notre Dame can be violent and sadomasochistic in his desires for Asmerelda. You know, he even wants to burn Asmerelda at the stake at the end of the movie, and it's largely been reviewed and, and commentated on that even for this, uh, even in this moment, it was part of sort of a sexual fetishism that this holy man had about a gypsy girl in Paris. You know, violence and desire is are inextricably linked. And Anakin is a violent person. He does not enact those impulses in this scene where he is being rejected by Padme in his advances here. But there's so much tension boiling in this episode two scene where he is upset. You can see that he is angry that he is being spurned. He's making a physical advance on her, walking up closely and invading her space. Uh, but this is, of course, realized many years down the road, Anakin does become violent. He violently chokes Padme in episode three, the, the Revenge of the Sith, and it contributes very much to her death. Um, he makes a bunch of moral mistakes and missteps throughout Star the Star Wars series, and he never blames himself. He blames others. When he falls to the dark side, he blames Obi-Wan. He blames Padme, but he doesn't ever look in the mirror. And so when he makes these mistakes, he attacks Padme. And this is all connected to shame, violence, power, desire. Um, the authoritarian projects responsibility for their desires out onto other people. They don't look in the mirror and look inward for where these desires come from. They projected onto minority groups, migrants, the other, the devil, but never themselves. Cloud Frollo and Anakin both share this. Meanwhile, Scar's lust for absolute power manifests itself in slightly different ways. We don't get the sexual deviance, although of course we get the infamous sex easter egg earlier in the movie, but we do see him explode in violence, like when he slaps Sarabi. Largely, however, the Lion King emphasizes Scar's lust for power through the juxtaposition between Scar and characters who are physically weaker than he is, and one who's physically stronger. I'm gonna be king of Pride Rock. Oh, goody. My dad just showed me the whole kingdom, and I'm gonna rule it all. <laughs> well, forgive me for not leaping for joy. I'm bad back, you know. Just look at Scar in this scene from his posture to his physicality to the way that he carries himself. Everything about the way that Scar looks is the opposite of what we consider to be strong, heroic traits. Shoulders back, head up high, muscles. He is thin, he's wiry, he's lazy, he lays on the ground in depressed fashions. He represents the, the sick weak man fueled by really nothing more than bitterness, entitlement, and envy. He doesn't actually have real strength, the kind that his brother Mufasa does, which is why he was never going to take Mufasa in an honest fight. He had to trick him into, you know, trick him into falling from a cliff and, you know, killing him in, a, in an act of deceit. You know, these kinds of villains stab you in the back because they're not actually strong. 
And Scar, Scar also, you know, makes reference to his bad back and his aching body. Oh, I feel simply awful. You know, he's just not a healthy leader who has his, uh, his own business together. You know, just like many of our, many of our, our sort of dark figures of, of real world history, whether it be, you know, mass shooters to the Columbine kids to uh, dictators, uh, they are people who are not actually embodying what we consider to be strong, confident traits. They are usually wiry, thin, dark, brooding, unhealthy. Uh, Hitler himself, you know, he was a, a huge proponent of, of healthy lifestyle, and he highly loathed smoking in his presence, and he wanted to make sure that that was not part of the Third Reich at all. He didn't eat meat. Uh, he was highly critical of drug use and alcohol. Uh, but then he also had his own debilitating health issues that we're still learning more about as, as time goes by, uh, and a possible drug addiction himself, so that he could appear strong to the people of Germany. The illusion had to be maintained. But so much about what we know about Hitler was that he was very much unhealthy and in a lot of pain. The three dictators we've discussed span Disney's timeline and canon of intellectual property, and the similarities are blindingly clear. They leave us with a profound takeaway that we can and should carry with us. The people who seek to run the world are, in the final analysis, often deeply troubled, weak, insecure, even psychologically and sexually repressed. But that's not the only lesson. In establishing these totalitarian characters this way, the Disney franchise also establishes the inverse. Those of us who think we could try to run the world, but don't, choosing instead to focus on our own lives, are, in a way, heroic. We all have a little bit of dictator inside of us and the potential for enacting authoritarianism. Every one of us will live it out in different parts of our lives. For some of us, our politics are authoritarian. There are people who have and embrace the authoritarian instinct to control, control, control in their political views and in the way that they think society should be modeled. Then some of us reject that. We choose to give up control. We choose democratic life. We choose to give up those things in, in favor of things like liberalism. Anakin Skywalker, Cloud Frollo, Scar, these are all villains who are happy to assert control, to assert order into chaos, to take life by the reins, if you will, uh, you know, damn the consequences. Uh, that is the authoritarian instinct. Uh, we've all got that inside of us. We all have to look in the mirror and see it. Uh, and conquer it. And that's what makes us heroes. Not the absence of evil and not the absence of the desire to control, but the willingness to relinquish control. I'm reminded of probably the most heroic moment in Star Wars, which happens in Return of the Jedi, Episode 6, when Luke Skywalker, who has recognized that he too could become Darth Vader if he's not careful, he defeats his father, Darth Vader, has him on the ground, and the Emperor offers him the opportunity to become his new apprentice and help rule the galaxy. And Luke Skywalker has the weapon in his hand. He could do the deed, but he tosses it on the ground. And he says no. I'll never turn to the dark side. I am a Jedi, like my father before me. And all of us have that weapon, like we have that ability to wield power over others, but we say no to it. And that's what makes us heroes. <laughs>